Hi there, this is Mark Icero, and welcome to Article Club. Article Club is a newish experiment in community reading where we read, annotate, and discuss one great article every month along with the author. This month we are diving into The Mountain by Andrew Morantz, and this week I had the great fortune to be able to interview Mr. Morantz about his piece. If you haven't read the article yet, it is about a young woman named Samantha who becomes radicalized to join the alt-right. Article Clubbers naturally had a ton of questions about how this exactly happened, so I was really grateful that Mr. Morantz generously took the time to join us. Here's our conversation. Thanks, Andrew, so much for being on Article Club. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So your piece is wonderful. This chapter from Antisocial is really great. And we had a lot of questions. And the first one is Samantha called you, right? Sort of out of the blue? Yeah, semi out of the blue. You know, I had been reporting around this stuff for a while. And, you know, one of the things that happens when you're reporting in a particular milieu for a while is that, you know, word kind of gets out. And so she had heard through various people that I was someone she could talk to. And so she she got my number that way. And yeah, I had been kind of I had been kind of putting out feelers for someone like her, someone who could speak to these things in a way that other people couldn't. I just didn't know who or where she was, obviously. Can you take us back to what that was like when you got that call? So I was at the office late and you're always ready to get a call, but you're always not entirely ready to get a call like this. So I, you know, especially when you report on trolls and propagandists, and professional manipulators, you never know what's real, right? So when someone calls you out of the blue and says, I can't tell you my name, but I want to divulge to you how the whole alt-right works and why I'm leaving it, you know, your sort of, your skeptical hackles go up a little bit. So, and she obviously was skeptical of me for various reasons. So getting that first call was both exciting because I thought this could be really great if She's who she says she is. And I also thought with about 75% of my brain, this might not be real. So, you know, let's proceed with that. And I'm sure you get tons of calls and you talk to tons of people in all of your reporting. Did you have any sense about what your first impressions were her of her were? Did you did she feel any different to you than maybe anybody else that you talked to? Yeah, she was different in many, many ways. So yeah, I, I talked to all kinds of people who could shed light on various aspects of the stuff I was interested in, which was not only how the alt-right worked, but also specifically how our brains are warped by the mechanics and incentives of social media. And so that took me in all kinds of directions. I mean, it made me interested in the inner workings of the alt-right movement, but it also made me interested in how Reddit and Facebook work and how Silicon Valley culture works. And so I was used to a whole variety of, you know, people with different talking styles and different motivations. But generally, when you're talking to people who are professional propagandists, they're not going to be straight with you. They're not going to speak to you straightforwardly and honestly. They're going to try to spin you because that's what they do. And that's especially what they do to people in the media. And then there's the whole issue of, you know, talking to, let's say, hardcore anti-Semites as, as a Jew and talking to kind of insurrectionists anti-institutionalist kind of uh, guerrilla anti-media figures as a member of the quote-unquote establishment media. So there's all kinds of ways that you have to kind of dance around and ask things a hundred different ways to get at the truth. With Samantha right away, it seems like, okay, if this is actually a person who's grappling with actually leaving this movement, A, that's going to be an interesting story and it's going to be something that is kind of going to provide a bit of the puzzle that I've been putting together for years, but it also is going to be someone who can speak to me more honestly and truthfully because she's not trying to spin me. If anything, she's kind of trying to go to me to help her figure out what's real and what's not real. And it seems like there was trust over the tens and, and hundreds of hours that you talked with her. Obviously, she's just so such an interesting figure, uh, not just because she got out, but article clubbers really just have connected with her and sort of like who she is as a young woman. And so can you give a little bit more context about sort of how you would describe her as a person and her personality? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, she comes off as very personable and very kind of witty and sharp. She kind of seems 
savvy. She's very good at, you know, embedding various kinds of cultural references into casual speech. And she's very good at kind of immediate, immediate sort of displays of kind of conversational intimacy. So that's what made her a good bartender, for example, because she's very good at striking up a conversation and establishing a connection very quickly. It's also what made her a good recruit for an internet subculture because she's very good at assimilating various kinds of memes and adapting them into her speech. So, and, you know, in a way, that's what makes her so personable and so pleasant to talk to. But I think she would be the first to tell you that it's also kind of dangerous because it means that there's a much thinner barrier between sort of the performance she's doing for other people and who she is, you know, herself in her heart of hearts. I think those things can get easily confused for her. But that's not unique to her. I mean, I think the parasocial and interpersonal and performative aspects of our lives influence all of us in various ways, but I think for her, it's just more pronounced. And I think that kind of helps to explain in a way why she was so impressionable. Yeah, and it seems like she's also a little bit self-aware of that, <clears throat> excuse me, self, like self-conscious of that aspect of her personality. And you, you make a great point, obviously, that there's not a formula for becoming radicalized. Um, and there's a lot of different ways and it could happen really to any of us. But did you have a sense about like some of the key steps that may have, may have happened for Samantha that she sort of um, went in that direction? Well, yeah, so I think that is the first one, right? That, that, you know, and I think to some degree, we all have this kind of not entirely developed sense of self, right? Who am I really? What do I want really? What are my values really? In the absence of anyone else, in the absence of anything I read, anything I see, any social feedback I get, right? In a way, that's not even a realistic question to ask because we're always operating in social conditions. And I think in her case, her social conditions shifted so rapidly from, you know, the socially acceptable thing to do being, you know, canvassing for Obama on the weekends when she's a senior in high school to the socially acceptable thing to do being, you know, hanging out with people, especially this one boyfriend who, you know, spends too much time on 4chan to then suddenly sort of substituting the old kind of mental dialect she was used to speaking with this new dialect. And I guess you know, so there are some sort of outward personality markers, you know, someone, something I've kind of semi thought of as a pattern is, you know, a high IQ and a low EQ, you know, someone who's very verbally dexterous, but maybe not as good at, you know, reading people or even reading themselves as you might want. That could be one indicator, you know, a certain kind of you know, excitability, ability to get swept up in, in a meme without asking questions. And also, I mean, there are personality markers that would otherwise be really valuable and useful, like a desire to question established scenarios, you know, the kind of person who isn't content to, you know, see something on CNN and say, oh, okay, I'm sure that's the whole truth and there's nothing behind it. That is, that's a personality trait that you really want in a person, all things being equal. It just has to be balanced out with other kind of internal guardrails. Yeah, and one of the things you mentioned was this relationship with her boyfriend. And that is, I think, the first part of the chapter where we just thought was really wild with regard to like, not just a relationship, but specifically the actual step for how she got all in. And it's something that for me as a reader, I was like, whoa, this is pretty major. Do you feel like this is also an aspect of how it happens in that like that there needs to be or can be or sometimes is uh, a personal relationship that that moves somebody in that direction? Yeah, that definitely that definitely helps. And yeah, it's all, you know, I, as you say, I am reluctant to put a formula on it because it, it always happens different ways with different people. And I, and I don't want it to sound like, you know, some kind of, you know, dark magic, kind of reefer madness thing. You know, if somebody exposes you to the wrong website, you'll get bitten and turn into a zombie or something. I, I don't think it's like that. And I know some people are, are, you know, just generally sort of so eager to find a color by number of explanations that they will lead to that. And I, it's understandable, right? Because these are such novel and scary things that we want to be able to pin them down. But, but radicalization is another species of 
what we're all doing all the time, which is trying to make sense of the world, you know, and it's very easy to look at it as this foreign, terrifying thing, which in some ways it is, but in other ways, it's just people trying and failing in this case to make sense of the world around them. And we're all doing some version of that all the time. So yeah, it definitely helps to have someone in your life who you trust or feel indebted to or tied to in some way who's pulling you in this direction because it just gives you that much more weight and it gives you that much more of an impetus to um, look closely at it. And I don't think that necessarily there'd be a blanket rule that nobody should look closely at this stuff. Obviously, I've spent a long time looking closely at it, but you know, you know what you're doing before you wade into that muck and she, she, didn't, she didn't have that protection. But were you surprised? I mean, there's definitely a lot of us who are surprised that after breaking up, so quickly after like four or five days, uh, she comes back to Richie and says, you know, I'm all in. And I know that it's perhaps my and our snootiness, or I know some women also are being critical of her as well. Were you surprised as a reporter that that that, that happened? Well, look, I mean, obviously, it's fair to be critical of that decision. It's pretty much the worst decision you can make as a thinking person. So yeah, I'm obviously critical of it. I just, you know, I think explaining it and excusing it are obviously two separate things. I think there's pretty much no excuse for becoming a white nationalist, but there can and should be an explanation. And yeah, look, in in one sense, it is surprising that it happened so quickly and so precipitously. In another way, it's like, I think part of what we tend not to understand about this stuff, something I didn't really understand until I spent a long time looking at it, is that, you know, you might think based on the kind of mainstream coverage of this stuff that when you go to these hate-filled parts of the internet it's just a lot of people ranting and raving and it's just a picture of David Duke burning a cross and all this stuff it's really really not that and it's much savvier and on its face less obviously threatening right because that's how effective propaganda works so if you aren't specifically trained in critical thinking and how to debunk arguments you've never heard before and how to find statistics to go up against the carefully selected statistics you're being presented with and all that stuff, then yeah, it's totally understandable to me, if not excusable. I was going to ask this later, but you know, you talk about evidence, you talk about like looking at arguments, and a lot of us are educators. And so we might see some of our students who might be radicalized. And you know, all teachers are working on reading skills as well as like looking at arguments. Do you feel like that might be an aspect that I'm not saying that you should like decry all of American education or whatever, but do you feel like that there's a piece to it where if we were more critical and if we did read better, that maybe this wouldn't happen as much? Oh, for sure. I I think there's all kinds of, I think if we were better, it wouldn't happen as much. The question is how to make people better in practice. I definitely think education is one piece of it. I also think there are all kinds of other factors, psychological and economic, and how much you know mental space people have to process things, and Maslow's pyramid, and you know mental health, all kinds of things. So I don't want to pin it all on educators for sure. But yeah, education is one of the most powerful inoculations against this stuff you can have. But it's very tricky, right? There's I, I don't envy the dilemma that educators are in. It's kind of similar to the dilemma that a lot of journalists are in, right? Where you don't want to give any oxygen to this stuff. So you kind of try to uh, summarize it in a very careful and often cursory and dismissive way, because obviously it's totally fair ethically (laughs) to be dismissive of racist arguments, because they're bad arguments. But then the danger of that is that when people are then exposed to them, they, they are getting what they expect to get. And that can, in some cases, be a pleasant surprise for them in this in this counterintuitive way kind of like if you were to have an anti-drug education program from the 60s that said as soon as you smoke marijuana i'm doing my second reefer madness thing here but you know if you tell kids as soon as you smoke marijuana you know you'll turn into a demon or something and then that doesn't happen to them you know you 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 know that that whole argument so I, i don't have a perfect solution i don't think you should spend half of eighth grade civics class you know, walking through racist arguments in explicit detail and debunking them one by one necessarily, because in a way that might be a waste of time. But in another way, that would be really useful or some version of that. 
Yeah, we've been we've been talking about sort of like the proper role of being a teacher right now, or just in general, you know, this idea of all teaching is political. And so therefore, you're a person, you have a responsibility, but also you have your own politics. And so you might want to sort of say what is wrong, or what is correct. But obviously, you also have a responsibility to, to educate and just trying to figure that out, too, because you obviously know trolls and trolling. And it seems like if you're a teacher and you just say, hey, what you just said is horrible and racist and bad, you might actually not be- like there might not be any benefit. Do you feel that like there might be some similarities or some parallels there from from what's in the classroom versus what's on the Internet? Obviously, we all know that young people are spending way much more time on YouTube, for example, than listening to their teachers. Absolutely. And yeah, so you do need to pre- prepare them and in some sense inoculate them. And yeah, look, I mean, I say in the book elsewhere, not in this chapter, that trolls set an ingenious trap, right? Because if you give them any attention at all, then they use that as fuel. And if you totally ignore them, then they can pretend that that means that you have no problem with what they're saying. So it's kind of an impossible dilemma. And I think it's similar with this, right? As soon as you wade into this stuff, you're in dangerous territory and you might be introducing people to things that they wouldn't have otherwise encountered. And that feels really icky. And again, I struggle with this ethically as a journalist too, all the time. But of course, the flip side of it is that if you never mention racism in the classroom, you're certainly not doing a good job either. Right. So I try to sort of think about historical parallels. You know, it's much easier for us to teach racist pseudoscience of, you know, let's say the 19th century or the 18th century, because that feels like it's kind of out of state temporal difference distance from us. And in a way, I get that, but it also means that we understand the generations old versions of these arguments better than we understand the arguments that are being propagated right under our noses, right in front of us every day. So that can't be the full answer, right? If we're, if we're not, and this, this goes beyond educators, I think this is true of all, all members of the majority of society who want America to be a thriving, pluralist, multicultural nation and want, you know, women in the workplace, you know, all the basic established norms that have been fought for for decades not to be eroded. You know, they want those things in principle and they want them in the abstract, but they don't spend a lot of time looking at the forces that are actually trying to reverse and degrade those things. And, you know, obviously I think it's worth knowing your enemy, as it were, or I wouldn't have um, embarked on this project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's ways maybe of preventing or not necessarily preventing, but mitigating. But also what's so interesting with Samantha's uh, case is that she gets out. And obviously in your chapter, you talk about the specific moment where she gets out, but there's other times where she doesn't. Like even the scene with Richard Spencer, which is the other just really wild scene in the chapter. In fact, she gets even farther in. And so... It's just so interesting. Like, we can't necessarily predict who's going to get in, and it seems like we can't necessarily predict who gets out. Did you have a sense about, like, what happened for Samantha that she was able, not just to get out, but then to sort of reach out to you? Was there something special or different, or is it, again, just random? Yeah, I've puzzled over this. I mean, I don't know that it's entirely random, but I do think it is hard to predict. You know, maybe it's more, like, stochastic than it is random, but it's... I think it was a a mix of motivations. You know, I think on one level, she wanted to, I think on the most innocent level, she wanted to help people who might be in her position in the future to not go down the path she went down. And then like anyone, you know, that altruistic motivation might be mixed with less altruistic motivation, you know, wanting to protect her own hide a little bit or wanting to tell her side of the story or wanting to, you know, make sure she wasn't going to get doxxed. I mean, there were all kinds of, stages she went through and I think now that it's been so long she well not so long but it's been long enough that she feels like okay now I'm really fully out you know I've gotten rid of my funnel and I've lost contact like I, I'm trying to live my life but you know this went through lots of stages she called me right as she was stepping out the door so at that point if she had been docked she would have been essentially outed as a member of this group that she was trying to lose which would have had its own set of consequences in her life Right. And she also mentally wasn't fully out yet. I mean, that takes a process. That takes time, too. I mean, it sort of reminded me of, you know, coming up from a really deep underwater dive, you know, without getting into the bend. You know, you have to come up slowly. So it's a it's a process. And I think like anything, when, you know, somebody is paying their debt to society, 
after a crime or, you know, coming back from, from grief or, you know, any of these kind of really kind of, you know, terrible rites of passage that people go through. I mean, this is obviously a very particular one that most people are not going to go through, but in my observation, it followed a similar pattern where she was really confused and really distraught. And also, you know, there was a whole mix of motivations, some more lofty than others. Well, it's definitely a hopeful story. I guess I guess a possible warning also is that it may lead the reader to say, hey, well, this is a great story. This is a hopeful story. And and I am a good person versus like this bad person potentially who became good, which you definitely warn against at the end of your chapter. You say that it's not about being good or bad. It's not about like trying to get rid of the bad apples, which I think is really, really important for the reader to consider. But the biggest thing that I think that I got out of reading it is really just this idea about the the arc of history, not just for her, but for all of us. And can you say a little bit more about how you sort of construct that idea of the arc of history bending? Yeah, and this is a, a larger theme that's kind of woven through the whole book and, you know, kind of builds throughout. But as you say, it's mentioned in this chapter that, you know, there's this kind of underlying assumption, I think, in a lot of kind of contemporary progressive politics, or even just generally, you know, contemporary progressive norms or ideas. It doesn't have to be explicitly political, you know. I mean, Barack Obama says this, but also just this is something that I think Mark Zuckerberg believes, too. And I think it's also just something that your average person on the street believes without really thinking it through fully, which is the art of history bends toward justice. And that's in the aggregate, a process that happens automatically, you know, that, you know, yes, there are brave people like Martin Luther King who push it forward, but I think the tacit assumption is that it kind of would have happened anyway. It just happened a little faster because of certain people or, you know, that there's a kind of semi-predetermined arc to history. It's actually this very Hegelian idea. Again, you don't, it doesn't mean that you, your average person on the street is getting it from Hegel. I think it's just, it, it comes to us through cultural osmosis. And normally we don't have that much necessity to question it, right? Because you see so many things that do move in this generally uh, positive direction or this direction of increasing personal freedom or whatever. So, you know, you sort of think broadly, okay, we, and, and you hear people like Mark Zuckerberg say this, well, you know, we might take one step back, but then we take two steps forward. And it, it just never seems to cross their minds that, you know, you could take one step forward and two steps back, right? It just, they seem to know the, the, the telos of history as almost an article of faith. And I just think that is really wrong and really dangerous. And so I try to, you know, it's not a book of philosophy per se, but I try to marshal some thinking on this to, to show that, you know, contemporary philosophers don't agree with this. And it, it can blind you to some real contrary evidence that you won't want to see if you take teleology as an article of faith. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that. And thank you for all of your time. This has been really great. I have one more question, if that's all right. Is that all right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The the last question is obviously we're an article club and so and we're in this time of possibly great change as well as just like maybe it is up to us to try to bend the arc of history and we're like a reading club and so can you what do you feel right now is the purpose of reading and what can we get out of it and not just your piece but like pieces in general Well look I mean I'm I'm not like a pure utilitarian on this so I, I think, you know, I can make a consequentialist argument for why it's good to read because it, you know, you learn things and you learn how to treat people better and you develop more empathy and that makes you, you know, act better in the world. I, I believe all those things. I think they're true. But if I'm being really honest, I don't think that's the purpose of reading, at least not for me. I think the purpose of reading is because learning stories and experiencing stories and telling stories and, and discovering truths about ourselves is just sort of what human beings do. So I, I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive, you know, the kind of Kantian reason for, for reading, for lack of a better term, versus the consequentialist reason. I think they can both be true, and I think they are both true. When you get down to pure utilitarian math, you know, one of my favorite three books, Strangers Drowning, by Larissa McParker, and she has all these people who are extreme altruists who sort of say, why would I do something like reading when I could be you know, donating my plasma or, you know, sending malaria nets to countries with them? And that's a valid argument. And I can't really tell you, oh, if you spend more time reading, you know, fewer people will die of malaria. I actually don't have a mechanism to prove that that's true. 
I just think that utilitarianism is not a frame to look through the world through. And sometimes I'm convinced by that argument and sometimes it makes me feel callous. But, you know, I think ultimately there are just people who write and read and listen to stories and that's what they do. And in order to feel fully human, that's what they're going to do. So I just kind of try to accept that about myself anyway. That's great. And thank you so much, Andrew, for all of your time and for sharing with us your thoughts and for being on Article Club. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for reaching out. I want to thank Andrew Morantz once again for joining us at Article Club and for sharing his insightful thoughts. I really, really appreciate it. Also, I want to thank you out there, Article Clubbers and folks maybe thinking about being part of Article Club, who uh, took a listen. Thank you very, very much for doing so. If reading and annotating great articles and discussing them with other thoughtful people appeals to you, and if you enjoy hearing what writers have to say about their work, I hope that you'll want to find out more about Article Club. You can do so over at articleclub.org. If Mr. Morantz's The Mountain is intriguing to you, there's still time to sign up for this month's discussion on Sunday, June 28th. You can go to highlighter.cc slash discussion for more info. All right, that's it for now. Thank you again and have a great week.